everyone. Uh, today um, we are here with uh, Gabriel Magos. Uh, is yeah, and um, I I met Gabriel on social media, and I found his projects to be really uh, prolific and amazing. Um, he's an experimental artist currently living in Switzerland. We will get to hear more about his projects and about himself later in the podcast. Hi, Gabriel. How are you doing? Thank you very well. We had a, a surprisingly warm weather, so I'm still a bit uh, sweating because okay. uh, we were outside. We had a long walk uh -huh. uh, with, with the parents of my wife. Plus, I'm, of course, a bit nervous because this is on, on this long distance, you know, uh -huh. <laughs> uh, to talk about this project, which is very much physical and very much happening Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Plus, plus uh, getting the chance to really to really spread out the whole whole uh, project as as a whole mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is is uh, is very demanding. So I hope mm -hmm. that I can match that. Absolutely, no problem. Just uh, um, just that's okay to take your own time and you know pace uh, yes. and to like uh, tell us what your project is about. I think you have a story to share before we begin talking about uh, your project in detail, your project about flags. Shall we first share your story and then give a bit of uh, background and then can we move on to discussing your project? Yes. Yes. Well, I have done a lot of very different uh, artistic projects in the last, let's say, 40 years, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, it has taken many winds and turns my path. Mm -hmm. And now uh, it feels like now with this project, with uh, this flags project, I have arrived um, to my to the core to the core of what I want to talk about and mm -hmm. many things that I worked on before are so sort of melting and joining in and they things come together mm -hmm. and this is also because I'm taking the roots of what I'm doing uh, very serious now which is uh, which is an autobiographic route Right. You know, I think that all all work and all artistic work, in, in, in special, have a in a, in the end have an autobiographic root. Uh -huh. Some show it stronger and some show it less, but you will always find it. And of course, I also I I am trying to make a transformation mm -hmm. of this autobiographic root. But this root is that our family. Uh, had to flee from Hungary in in the, in November uh, 1956 as a as a consequence of the Hungarian Revolution, mm -hmm. where my parents, especially also my father and the brother of my mother, were very much involved. So we really had to go. Mm -hmm. The grandmother said, "Please leave." So we left. Um, the the my aunt with her son and my mother and the three kids. I was the youngest, mm -hmm. he left and the, uh, my father, he came later. He, he tried to, to, well, to see what can be still done within the revolution. Yeah. And the brother of my mother, he got caught and he was later executed. Mm -hmm. So we came and I was three and a half and, uh, and I didn't know what it was all about. I yeah. I only knew I have to leave my my sandbox and we have and it's dangerous and it's dangerous mm -hmm. and we have to leave everything behind and well I think my first memory is as far as I could trace it back my first memory is Vienna so okay. when we were already out mm -hmm. but I was I had I was very afraid I was screaming and my mother had to tell me a story. And basically we just, well, I'm not going to tell the whole flight. Mm -hmm. It's being actually described in a book that has been written by a Swiss lady called Regula Schiers. It is called uh, Wie das Leben nach dem Fieber, how the life after um, the fever, it can mm -hmm. be found. It's a very, very interesting book, which mm -hmm. is an interview with my parents. And there this flight is, uh, also. 
Okay. So then arriving in Vienna with just the clothes, the clothes we had on basically and no papers and nothing else. I had a perception, uh, uh, I don't know, a perception, a feeling, a very basic feeling, which I trace back in my memory, which this feeling has, has uh, accompanied me. It was with me all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's becoming clearer and clearer now what this feeling was and how it felt then and how it feels now. And it hasn't basically changed. Mm -hmm. And I will try to describe this feeling because it's crucial. Well, it's crucial to everything I do. Okay. And I'm slowly starting to find out that it's a feeling that basically everybody knows mm -hmm. in different modes. I mean, not everybody's a refugee, but it's, it, it's, it is a feeling that has so basically to do with what um, human condition is that mm -hmm. I will try to describe it now. Mm -hmm. My roots were cut off. So I yeah. was in Vienna as a three and a half years old boy. And I suddenly, there was freedom. That was freedom. I it's mean, okay. we had mm -hmm. to, we had, we had escaped from the danger. Mm -hmm. So that was a big and incredible relief. Absolutely. And to me, as a three and a half years old boy, I was there in Vienna. I had nothing to do. I didn't have to go to school. Yeah. We had a shelter because we were with a, with a priest family. They offered us, okay. everybody was helping. Okay. So we got food, we got clothes. Uh, it was an incredible relief, a feel of freedom, and we had the time all the day. So we were hanging out in the city, mm -hmm. rolling around. We were in the main station, and the big show was to do the moving chairs up and down okay. in, in the station. And still now, I tell you, still now, when I'm in the station and I go on the moving chairs, mm -hmm. and I've done that hundreds, thousands of times in my life, I still get this feeling. Absolutely. It's absurd. I mm -hmm. go up a moving chair, another moving chair, a moving stair. I'm sorry, you understand me? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. I'm going up or down a moving stair in any station, mm. be it Zurich or Budapest or Vienna or London or Paris or New York or, or Mumbai. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is moving chair. No, stairs, I don't think so. There isn't, it, right? Um, I'm not quite sure. Uh, anyway. About, yeah. And suddenly it opens up okay something opens up it's like wow this is the world this is the universe i'm here i can do anything perfect mm -hmm. at, at the same time or not maybe i don't know i'm still trying to find out if it's at the same time or if it comes later an incredible fear okay what's going to happen mm -hmm. where do i belong to what what happened do i fly away I have to belong to somewhere. Yeah. This is the basic situation of a refugee. And I think basically of every human. Absolutely. Every human has this potential mm. of freedom. And at the same time has this very basic need of having to belong to some place, to have a shelter, to have food, to have security. Because if you go out in freedom, you won't survive for long. You need these things. So, yeah. This is the basic feeling I was trying to describe. Yeah. Could I describe it? Absolutely. Absolutely, Gabriel. Yes. Uh, what what paved way, what made you think about the Flags Project? Like, I, I'm sure you've done a lot of uh, artistic work before um, you started uh, conceptualizing about your Flags Project. Uh, how did this come into you know effect? How? what kind of like, I understand from your story that it would have had a huge impact. Um, but in your, in your context, um, what really triggered you to start this project? This project was triggered, um, well, there is a few routes. Does it, it doesn't bother that I have this chap on, right? No, absolutely not. It's it perfect. It's like a shade, you know, it's a bit. It's perfect. I have it when I teach also. <laughs> it's um, fine. It's perfect. Um, 
Well, the beginning, I was trying to trace back the beginning of the flag, flags project and I made I made one flag, or no, actually two flags. Okay. Just were there someday. I didn't think much of it. One flag was a white flag. So okay. they, it must be a year or two or three years ago. I don't remember. I stitched a piece of white cloth to bamboo stick, and there was the white flag. Right. It was just there. I didn't use it. It okay. was there. Okay. That was one flag. And the other flag was a piece, a big piece of paper on a wooden stick, not a very nice one, mm -hmm. on which I wrote, I wrote, here art is being made. This is the workshop of an artist. Mm -hmm. Art uh, opens perception, crushes boundaries, tames demons, nourishes the soul. Mm -hmm. This was the second flag, I just made it. But this second flag, actually I made it because I had the feeling that when I work in my atelier, mm -hmm. suddenly the world is crushing on me. The, the, the weight of the world, the outside world is getting too heavy. It suffocates me. I can't breathe anymore. I can't work. Mm -hmm. And I had like to free myself from this and put out a sign declaring this is the workshop of the artist. Here art is being made, art is this and this, just to reassure myself of what I'm doing and to tell the world this is what is happening here. So I made this flag. It's a very rugged flag. Okay. It, I had to mend it again and again. It looks it looked completely rugged and torn now, but I still have it. And I was hanging this flag outside of my workshop just to tell the world, I am an artist. This is what I'm doing. Don't crush on me. I want to believe in myself. Absolutely. So I had two flags. Okay. And then one day I said, flags, flags, flags. I have a white flag, why don't I use it? Mm -hmm. So I went outside with the white flag. I went in the city. I mm -hmm. was carrying the white flag. And I thought, this is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Now I'm a peace activist. I'm not an artist anymore. Okay. My artistic career is done because you can't, you can't mix the two things. You have to be very clear about these things. Mm -hmm. And I stopped and then something urged me, I had just had to do it. I said, I don't care. I have to go out with this white flag. Yeah. And then I remembered that when I was a little boy, I saw this man, I wrote it on the paper, Mark Stadtbinder. This mm -hmm. in the sixties, this was the, the most best known Swiss peace activist. Mm -hmm. He was standing there in, in the city mm -hmm. on a little box. And he said, Alle Menschen, Brüder, leg die Waffen nieder. That means uh, in his Swiss accent, all mankind, our brother, brothers and sisters, put their weapons down. Okay. He was a peace activist. Okay. He went to Moscow. He was on the Red Square in the, okay. in the time of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. That impressed me so much. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, if I'm going now with the white man, people are going to ask me, are you a, a, a rebirth? Are you a re reenactment of Mark Stadtbinder? What would I answer? And then I was asked, actually, and right. then I said, you know, of course not, because Mark Stedwiedler did things I'm, I, I don't have the courage to, and I can't do it now. Mm -hmm. they, I, I couldn't go on the red square with the white flag, no chance. Mm -hmm. Or, well, maybe I could risk it. I have a family, I have two kids. Anyhow, and plus, I am not Mark Stettwiller, but even to be compared to him is such an honor Absolutely. that it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing these white flag uh, performances in public space. And yeah. then I realized it, well, I'm not mainly 
a, a peace activist, but I may be an artist. So what do I do with this white flag? What does it mean to me? What kind of a sign is it? Mm. Which story do I tell? I started to wave the white flag. I invented this performance of the white flag waving. So these are the two first flags, flag experiences. Right. And like for those of us, like we have a very conventional uh, meaning that we have assigned to a flag. Like it kind of uh, tells us that it's about, probably about a country or about a territory. How do you and your project kind of uh, take the meaning or make meaning about the flag? What is, is there a particular definition that you go by um, about the flag? Um, yes. Um, well, when I saw, I saw that this flag, especially the white flag, Mm -hmm. but any flag, but now my experience was with the white flag. Mm -hmm. I saw what an incredible impact it had on the people. People were standing, they were looking, they still do that, they talk to me, mm -hmm. they make signs, they say, yeah, peace. And I realized that everybody knows it. Mm -hmm. Even the children, people from other cultures. I had people from many different cultures from all over the world, they stood and they watched me and they knew what this sign was. So I asked myself, what is this? There is a piece of white cloth yeah. stitched to a stick. Before, when it's only the white cloth and it's only the stick, it's nothing. Yeah. I take a bow stitch and I make clock, 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 clock. I put this white cloth to the stick and suddenly bang. It is something that people have an association. They know, they have an idea. This is a flag. Mm. So I started to ask myself, I try to go one step back. Okay. What is a flag? Yeah. I have this philosophy, I call it positionism. Okay. I'm not going to talk about it now. And the idea of this positionism is that we always have to go one step back. Right. Everything in thinking, in the language. Uh, my, my image I use is that when you have the chess game, we always talk about the chess figures and the yeah. rules. Yeah. We never talk about the chess board. Okay, yes. <laughs> so what is a flag? Forget nationalism, forget okay. all the things that are on the flag. What is a flag? Mm. And when you study that, when I ask anybody in the world, be it anywhere, everybody will say it's a piece of cloth on a stick. <laughs> yes. All the 8 billion people on this planet will give me the same answer. Imagine mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Everybody on this planet knows what a flag is. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know it. Yes. Right? Absolutely. If I ask you uh, what a flag is, make me the most simple description, or you draw it on a piece of paper, you make this this, 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 bang. Can you see it? Yes, I can see it. Yes. It's like, it's like an icon. Right? Yes, yes. But the interesting thing is this icon is being used in computer language also, the flagification. Okay, okay. Question. I'm doing the research. So when you ask me what is a flag, to me, then my first answer is it's a piece of cloth on a stick. Mm. Let that sink in. Yes. Before yes. <laughs> yes. You think what is on the flag? Absolutely. Because in my research, I found out that everybody mm -hmm. on this planet, when they talk about the flag, they talk about what is on, on the, the flag. flag. Mm -hmm. Nobody. I haven't mm -hmm. found anybody yet, except one Italian scholar who, in two sentences, mentioned a bit of my idea, mm -hmm. but a flag, when you ask me what is a flag, I say a flag is a piece of cloth on a stick. Yeah. Let that sink in. Now, what is the next question? What is it there for? Okay. Right? 
So you would ask, why would humans make such a thing to put a piece of cloth on a stick? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Why would they make it? Um, for me, it's probably in a way to uh, mark their boundaries, at least in the sense that um, as probably as a symbol, not not in the sense that as an official flag, but even as a symbol, they would try to sort of use it as, you know, mark a boundary or a territory or their space, something like that. Right. That's what they do. It. This is already one step back. Okay. It's a mark. It's a mark. It's a sign. It's a signal mm -hmm. to, to, of belonging, mm -hmm. of marking territory. Yeah. Now let's try to make one step more back. Yes. Behind that, what do you think where we arrived then? Um, well, my image is that, well, not my images, this is my thesis. This yeah. is what I say, that's what it is. I say it's the wind. I say it's the wind. It is, in old times, uh, people started to use it, the, the, the terrain, they started to make agriculture, they had cattle, they had herds, mm -hmm. and they were absolutely dependent on the weather. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We are still dependent. Absolutely, on the yes. And the interesting thing is that the wind still is today so strong that it can turn a ship in the Suez Canal and block yeah. the, the, <laughs> the whole traffic. That's yeah. the wind. Yeah. So I say the flag, if you go one step back, it's about the wind. Mm. People found out that if we want to know which way we have to go with the cattle or how do we have to build the house, mm -hmm. we have to know the weather. Mm -hmm. And the weather is brought and taken away by the wind. In, mm -hmm. the old, in the old Greek times, they had names for the winds. And those names were also for the type of weather. I mean, okay. we have this here still. We have the fern, for example. Okay. The wind, the warm wind, and it's also a type of weather. Mm -hmm. So they they found out if you make a stick and put something on it, which in the beginning was a leather, the oldest flags they found were leather flags. Okay. But they were moving in the wind. So it is an indicator of the wind, of the direction of the wind. That's what, to me, the original uh, reason why people would take a stick. I mean, why would they do it? There were no countries, there was no, I mean, the, the concept of territory wasn't, it, it was slowly coming about, but they yeah. were out with their beasts or something. And they saw when, when the clouds come from here, we have to run to the shelter, but when they suddenly realize, oh, but when the wind comes from here, we don't have to run. Mm -hmm. So we need something. Okay, they could hold up the finger, but even better is to take a stick, put a piece of paper, and that will show the wind. Yeah. This is my thesis. I'm ready if anybody will come and say, you are not right. I'm waiting for that person who will tell me this is not the origin, but I haven't found that person yet. Okay. Does that convince you? Hey, yes, absolutely. It's yeah. it's a it's a new refreshing perspective um, that that I've never thought of. You know, um, right. yes, absolutely. I've never thought of that. And this project, as you know, as kind of like tying it with your experience, your embodied experience. Is it then that the, the meaning, the thesis then, does it suggest, I mean, this is, this could be a very over, like an oversimplification of your thesis, but I'm just curious to know, um, does it then suggest that your, you being a refugee coming to Vienna and dealing with, you know, your identity, your belonging, does this signal a kind of like a, a, a new direction then? in terms of using the metaphor of the wind and the flag, is it, is it kind of a new direction in conceptualizing the flag? Is it a new direction in your artistic life? 
is it a new direction in your thinking is it okay to think about that like it like like that well yes you are already saying it yourself okay think from the wind mm -hmm. from the weather to the concept of identity there is a link there is a basic very deep link mm -hmm. of the concepts that have been created of identity in all the ages these concepts they are changing but there is a there is a yeah well let's call it the concept of identity yeah and this identity of us humans is absolutely linked to what we call perception mm -hmm. and orientation okay identity has to do with perception how we perceive the world and ourselves mm -hmm. and it has to do with how we orientate ourselves okay. that's what identity is about and that's what identity is for okay and this as we we are physical beings mm -hmm. right and we have a surface and we have senses we have eyes ears nose mouth and especially we have a skin yeah the skin is our surface and the skin is uh the organ through which we perceive mm -hmm. And even the senses, the eyes, the mouth, and the ears, and the nose is placed within this surface. Okay. But one of the first uh, perceptions and a very basic perception is temperature. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have to have warm enough when we sleep at night, otherwise we freeze. Mm -hmm. And it's the surface of the skin that is a very basic factor of our identity mm -hmm. now like for example now it's the faces i see your face you see my face yeah the biggest uh, surface we see is the skin right yeah it's only the eyes the nose and the mouth within this but it's skin 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 yeah so our identity and the skin is very in a very basic way linked the skin is where we regulate the temperature so the skin is where we feel the wind mm -hmm. so here we are with the wind again mm -hmm. and i feel and i can't express it in words uh perfectly but i feel that there is a such a basic link from the skin which is a surface mm -hmm. to the flag which is a surface right right the flag is also a surface yeah that carries information and the skin is a surface that carries information it carries the information of our identity yeah do you follow me yes you still follow me yeah yeah absolutely okay so they had this stick with a piece of cloth that was showing the wind mm. and then they realized on this surface, I can put information. Yeah, yeah. This is the second step. Mm. To me, the flag is the first movable information carrier uh -huh. after mm. us humans. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. The first one is me, the person, mm. because I'm moving and I have a surface. Mm. Right? I'm mm -hmm. coming out, I'm standing, I'm looking at you, I'm smiling. Mm -hmm. it's an information. Yeah. The flag, you hold it, you put it up, and you can put information on the flag. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So this is the link from the flag to the coming into being of the concept of identity. Mm -hmm. What I'm talking now about is i find is the basis of how our concepts from scratch are being made mm -hmm. and i hope that i could uh, convey it in such words that you could understand what i'm what i'm trying right. to say yeah you still follow me yeah absolutely yes this is the link 
And then, of course, this surface mm -hmm. was used, was instrumentalized for, in the end, for the power, for the nations, for organizations, for yeah. military. Then came the military. So first was the wind, mm -hmm. then came the, the, the flag as a the first moving uh, information carrier, of information. carrier yeah. Okay? yeah, and then came the battle. Mm -hmm. They were holding these things, and there were signs on it. In the Romans had this, this big thing, you know, and other armies had, because yeah. they realized we can use this that our troops know where the other, where which one are our troops. Mm -hmm. All the all the group different groups of you know the, the the horses and those on the on the ground and those with the with the you know, it, it bows and arrows and all these things yeah. they had these signs insignia and they realized we can use it for this so mm -hmm. in each army there were the standard bearers those guys or mostly who were carrying these things and they were protected. There were four or five people standing around them. Because when you catch the flag of the enemy, you 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 defeated him. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. When you had this flag, they didn't know anywhere uh, anymore where to go. They mm -hmm. were just running around because the flag was away. Mm -hmm. So the fight was going for the flag. Right. And this is where the military came in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we had first the wind then the information and then the instrumentalization of this possibility right of a moving information, information. Carrier. carrier yeah mm. and here we are now what we are doing is also a moving information carrier the mm. laptop it's moving you are moving i am moving that's why we watch because it's moving yeah this also goes back to the flag and to the wind. You see there? Absolutely. You see it? Yes. So this is what my project is all about. One more sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, when I talk about the instrumentalization, then the big door is open to the research into how where, what for, in which way this is being used and misused. Mm -hmm. How do you theorize the concept of flagification? You, you, you mentioned it before. Um, how does it connect with um, what we have been discussing so far? Well, now I hope I'm not I'm not talking too theoretically. No, absolutely not. Okay. Yeah. Flagification. Uh, the the term flagification came to me because I was trying to understand what is happening in that moment where I attach this piece of cloth to the stick. This process of putting right. one thing to another and teaching it together. What is exactly happening here? Both get attached. You attach both I together. Attach something to something else. Yeah. And I was meditating on this process of attaching one thing to another. <laughs> and then I came from the term attaching, I came to the term assigning. And I was out in the woods and I was drawing on the on the on the on the ground on the earth. I was drawing this earth flag and I was thinking about this connection. And suddenly I started to understand that the process of assigning is absolutely basic to our thinking to our philosophies, to our concept making. 
it's all an assigning everything we do. I had this image that in the old times, a, a person, a species of mankind was standing outside and seeing this big world, this universe, and starting to think. And it was just too much, too big. I mean, it is too much, too big. We don't understand anything of what is. We are having so much science, but basically we don't get it. Yeah. It's too big. You have the whole universe and everything and, and fate and Newman and nations and why is this planet in this universe and the sun and we with two legs and it's so much. <laughs> it's just it's just completely overwhelming. Right. So then this brain wanted to somehow get hold of this, somehow grasp it, and started to do what I say, assigning Newman to cluster. This is the sentence I have coined. Right. With Newman, I mean this big, vast, it's a Latin word, it's used for fate also, but it's right. by, different, by different people. I use Newman for this big, vast, whatever that is just too big. This okay. is the whole thing. Assigning this to, to, to groups that smaller units. Yeah. So mankind, this word was coined for all these beings with heads and arms and legs that are running around. This cluster is called mankind, mm -hmm. or wood. Okay. So we are assigning all these trees that are together. This cluster we call wood, mm -hmm. or we are constructing letters and words, and we pull pull them together, and we call this language. Mm -hmm. Or we invent sciences, and we put them in a house, and then we call this university. So we, this is the functioning of language. We try to make smaller units. Mm -hmm. So this is the process of something that you cannot really grasp, that is moving in the wind. We don't we can't really grasp the wind. It's such, such, it's such a mystery, the wind. Mm -hmm. But we stick it to a pole so we, we can get hold of it, you know. This is what I mean by flagification as a basic process of assigning the one that is too big to grasp to smaller units that we can deal with. And very interestingly, I was Googling flagification and I found this expression in very complex text about uh -huh. computer science. Uh -huh. It is being used there. There yeah. is the whole research of clusters uh -huh. in the computer science. They talk also of clusters. Ooh, and okay. then they use this expression of flagification. And I'm, I'm trying to find out if they mean, actually they mean exactly the same thing. This mm -hmm. assigning, you know. The big, I mean, because the computer, this artificial, artificial intelligence is such a vast field. Mm -hmm. Nobody can really grasp it. So smaller units have to be made. The whole information has to be assigned to one program, one research, one company, one laptop, one yeah. project. Mm -hmm. Okay, so much to this. Yeah. Could I? You make absolute sense, yes. That sounds great. I yes, I'm. I'm sorry to like keep, uh, you know, making you talk. I know it's a bit tiring, uh, but I you're have tired, like. But I am tired. <laughs> I think you're tired because it's a lot to talk about. And, no, I could uh, talk for hours. Oh, that's great. That's wonderful. If I look tired, if I may look tired. Uh, it, no, you don't. It has to. But if I may, it okay. always because people ask me that sometimes. It's because. <laughs> When I try to concentrate or focus, I get in a standby modus. Ah, yes. Okay. I switch off everything outside. Yeah. 
go completely inside to try to find the world. Mm. And this is why. That but is I can go totally to understandable. <laughs> Um, your, 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 like the philosophy that you talked about, like positionism, like taking a step back, and now this theory of flagification, where you bring the the woman to a cluster. How would you like find a connection? Do you find a connection between the two? Are those mutually kind of inclusive? A connection between the flagification and the positionism. Yeah, taking a step back. Taking a step back. Um, I was I was talking about that the two basic things are perception and orientation. Yeah. I feel that now I have been mainly talking about perception. Okay. Uh, as a constituent for identity. Okay. The other very strong constituent for for. Uh, for identity is orientation. Yeah. And orientation is uh, very basic. Right. When people, anybody in this world, anybody, be mm. it uh, dark or, or bright or small or big or young or old or rich or poor or mm -hmm. powerful or powerless, or healthy or sick or anything, everybody, when they get up at night mm -hmm. and they have to go to the loo, mm -hmm. to the toilet, they have to know where it is. Mm -hmm. Dark, the, the bladder or, or the, the intestines are pressing mm -hmm. and you find your way to the toilet. Mm -hmm. I had this very strong experience when I was 18. I went to India for one year. Oh, nice. And, uh, it was a very, very, very strong experience. And I really went down to the roots. I was walking around barefoot. I didn't talk anymore. Mm -hmm. And of course, I caught up a, a very strong diarrhea. And I was picked up by an ashram in Rishikesh, Shivananda Ashram. They, mm -hmm. they, they didn't want me. They sent me away. And I just rushed in. I rushed to the toilet. And then they realized we have to help this man. So they 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 sort of they sort of put me together for two or three weeks. And then the only thing was lying there and at night learn, knowing where I have to go. Go, yeah. That was all. That was the basic the 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 meaning of the life at that moment and mm -hmm. i think everybody knows what i'm talking about yeah right so this is orientation and this orientation at night when you wake up your mind puts a map together of uh -huh, left right left mm -hmm. and after a while you can do it with closed eyes or you can crawl one one time when i was in india i had a, i couldn't move my head because it knocking me out so I had to crawl on the floor I had to crawl on the floor but I still knew left right right and this orientation what I'm talking about is about positions where yeah. are you yeah. which where is left where is right where is the door where does mm -hmm. the light come from where is the food where is the door where I walk out to go to work where does the rocket come from And positionism is again going one step back because when you talk about position, it's again with the same thing with the flag. Everybody talks about the position they have. Yeah. I'm a leftist, I'm a rightist. Yeah. I'm for democracy. I'm in this party. Mm. Everybody talks about their position, but you have to go back one step to what is a position? Yeah. What is the definition of a position? And I found five basic uh, definitions of what a position is. Right. I'm not going to dwell into this more because this is the whole thing about positionism. What does it have to do with the flag? The flag is there to mark the position. Yeah. They fly on yeah. the moon mm -hmm. to mark the position. Mm -hmm. 
they put the flag on the tanks. The mm -hmm. flag is uh, showing the position of the country, mm -hmm. of the party, of the company. Mm -hmm. It is marked by the flag. So the flag has become the marker of, when you have a demonstration, they carry the flag. When you have a celebration in church, everybody's using the flag to mark their positions. Here we are. <laughs> or in a, in a car race, you know, time. So this is the connection of the position. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, let's uh, like, as a final uh, note, let's talk about your public performance. I think you, you, um, you take this project um, out and you also uh, uh, are engaged on pub, uh, social media as well. So let's talk about how uh, you try to materialize this uh, in the public space. Well, well, um, this is the biggest question in the whole project because uh, I have been doing this now for some time mm -hmm. and I have made expositions also. And when you make uh, expositions, you are in a safe space. You are, in a, you are in a gallery, you are in an art space, you are in a white cube. If people know where they have to come in, where they have to go. You have guards, you have the entrance fees, everything is organized. And I have this experience, I make expositions, I do exhibit my paintings for some time now regularly. Now it, there is a small stop because of the lockdown, but things are planned now. Mm -hmm. This is one thing. The other thing is uh, public space. Yeah. Public space is a mystery. Mm -hmm. And there is very much research about the public space mm -hmm. But there is one, again, there is one, uh, one basic quality to mm -hmm. public space that really nobody dares to enter into. And with positionism, I want to enter into this quality of the public space, which I will now to, to say in a few words what I'm talking about. The basic assumption is that we do not understand space. And I'm not the only one who says that. Big scientists have come to the conclusion there is no way we can ever understand space. Because everything we do, all the thinking, all the research, and even if we send rockets up to Mars, it's still such a tiny bit of what is there, of what is called space. Yeah. There is never ever going to be the, be the possibility that we can understand space. Mm -hmm. And this is fantastic. I find it the biggest miracle that exists. And at the same time, it's very frustrating mm -hmm. because we have to accept we cannot grasp space. Yeah. So on the second or the third flag I, I made, I wrote trying to surrender to my unability to understand space. This is very basic for me. So when I go out of the house, it's always this feeling of trying to connect to space, trying to feel the space. I just saw now a bird flying by. I mean, we can do, we don't understand the bird. It's not... I have to surrender to my unability to understand space. So when mm -hmm. I go out in public space, I always have this feeling. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to do with the fact if that there is a street and there are houses and I'm in a city or I'm in the countryside. Yeah. Because the sky above is there anywhere. Be it yeah. on Times Square or be it on, on uh, Adam's Peak. Mm -hmm. I've been on Adam's Peak in Sri Lanka. Yeah. Have you been up there? Uh, I'm not. I have been up there. You, you've been to the Adam's Peak. Wow, wonderful. 
Mm. And uh, the sky is the same anywhere. In here in the main, if I come out of my house or anywhere on this planet, you have this space. Mm -hmm. So when I go out in public space and I make something there, it's something so fundamentally different from mm -hmm. when I do it inside. I cannot, I cannot uh, overestimate this. Mm -hmm. But when I go out with the white flag in public space, it is a sign for the humans, the white flag, surrender. Yeah. It comes also from yeah. the war. You know, the army, yeah. when they took the white flag, it was surrendering. Yeah. It's giving up. We lost the battle. Take the weapons away from us. And at the same time, it's like a making a connection mm -hmm. to this vast something that I cannot understand, but I'm still, I'm holding up something into it, into this sky, the white flag, it could be blue flag also. And I'm just standing there, I'm exposing myself. And this, it's interesting, we are talking of expositions, yeah. but we go inside. We are not exposing ourselves. Yeah. It's so safe. I've seen fantastic exposition. I love expositions, mm -hmm. but it's not a really an exposition. Mm -hmm. It's an imposition. We go inside, <laughs> we build castles for these expensive paintings, which are gorgeous. I admire them. I have been, I spent months in museums, Munch, for example, Edward Munch. But when you go outside, that is an exposition because you expose yourself to this, to this. And so when I do this uh, performance in public space, I have to be very clear of that. I have to have the strength because I'm, I'm going to Parade Plaza, for example, which is a bank center. I'm standing mm -hmm. there in the front of the banks with my little red mat or with the white flag. Mm -hmm. And I have to know exactly what I'm doing. Right. Because of course, police is coming and they ask me, what are you doing here? What are you demonstrating for? And it depends absolutely about my attitude, how this, this, uh, how this uh, exchange, how this counter will be. Yeah. And of course, I always say I'm doing art. This is art. And they say, oh, it is art. Okay, great. And this is possible here, but there are places where I couldn't go out yeah. and say it's art because they would say, come on. We have been with a project on the road in Asia and some places they said, you can do it here. And it was nothing political. It was about looking for moments, it was cool. And some places they said, you better don't do it because if they don't, if people don't understand it. So that's why what I'm saying that people have told me that you should go with the white flag on, on these places on the red square. And I said, well, Box that Wheeler did it, but I don't think it's that easy these days. So I'm Absolutely. training. Mm -hmm. I'm training how far can I go that because I'm not polemic. I don't want to, I'm not demonstrating in that, in that uh, conventional sense of the word. I'm mm -hmm. not trying, I'm not seeking the confrontation. Mm -hmm. Yes. But I have to be conscious of the fact that it can be interpreted as somebody who is seeking the confrontation. Yeah, yeah. I'm not seeking the confrontation, but I'm just standing there with this attitude, trying to understand my own ability to understand space. So actually I'm the lost one. I'm the lost refugee in, in Vienna. who is standing there and feels this incredible potential of being a human being and having this freedom and at the same time being completely exposed, mm -hmm. totally. Absolutely. So this is my public uh, performance is about and I'm learning. Yeah. I'm learning, I don't know 
people always uh, they rush me and they say you should go to Times Square with these things. You should go to the big places. You should stand in front. I I did try a bit of that, but I don't think it's the right direction. Mm -hmm. I, I I can do it here in the street and on the hill and. Yeah. And the information goes out anyhow. Yeah. I don't have to, it's not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Such a wonderful perception. Uh, Gabriel, thank you so much for being with us today. Is there anything like any final comments, any remark that you want to add before we wind up? Um, any final remark? No, I think it. I think no. I, I it feels very good. I think you 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 asked very you know you you led me in a very nice way. So Thank I you, could Gabriel. Talk. That's a very nice feeling, you know, when you have somebody who leads you, so you can trust. And yes. I don't have to always keep. Oh, this has to be said. This has to be said. But I can talk freely. And I think I hope that I could uh, uh, convey some of what it's all about absolutely absolutely and uh, i hope of course that people who see this or hear this they can give them some impression information yes. insights yes that could be the most beautiful thing that 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 could happen absolutely and of course of course if there are questions I'm coming yeah yeah is there anybody that you would like to acknowledge at this moment that you would like to acknowledge, you know, you've been doing a lot of work. Is there anybody that you want to acknowledge? And so I, I'd like to give that space to you. Yes. I would like to acknowledge, uh, first of all, you. Thank you. For asking me to do this podcast, for giving me the chance to talk about my ideas, for mm -hmm. dwelling into my ideas, for I mean, you had to prepare yourself. You had to a bit follow my work, so you would know a little bit about it. Mm -hmm. So I could feel that from the way you were asking me uh, the questions. Um, so first of all, I would acknowledge you. Thank, Thank you, very you. Much. it's an honor, Gabriel. And then second, I would acknowledge Crescent C. Davis. <laughs> yes. This all, all, go, all goes back to him because he we somehow we got friends on on, on Facebook, Facebook and then started to get interested in my work and he had to convince me actually to become a member of this <laughs> because I was a bit reluctant because I said I'm not I'm not a, a, I'm not an academic and he said it's good exactly, enough exactly exactly it's good enough so he had yeah. to convince me and he did convince me and I'm very thankful for that that he could, he managed to uh, convince me. And then I would acknowledge uh, all the p wonderful people I could work with and I'm still work with and I'm in contact with for bigger projects that are in the pipeline, expeditions, yeah. and who, who, who support me in my work and, uh, and my family. Absolutely. It's my, an absolute, yeah. My wife and my two kids, uh, well, that's very basic. <laughs> and uh, I would like to acknowledge the whole rest of humanity. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's incredible. You know, it has to be told. I mm -hmm. have a final. I have a final thing. We are in very difficult times. Very, very. There are very big, basic dangers facing us, and if we don't uh, find solution for them. We, we can blow up the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I belong to those people who want to make a contribution for not blowing up the whole thing and, and giving some hints and information of how it could be done. And there are hundreds and thousands of other people who work on this. I find the people who work in GCAS also belong to these people. And um, even though there are all these incredible dangers and problems and crises with this pandemic now, that is hitting, I mean, some existentially. I still, well, of course, now always the word hope comes, you know, but I think I find there is something else also than hope. 
I, I never found the right word. People always ask, people always tell me, you do believe in something. You always say you don't believe in anything. You don't believe you just having this, uh, trying to surrender to my own ability to run that space. This is not believing. This is not giving me comfort. What gives you comfort? What do you believe in? And I couldn't put it in words. But I could say that I find it absolutely mind blowing that in this huge universe on one of these tiny little things, these conditions came together with the sun and the heat and the water and the air and the earth and then these plants and then animals and then these humans who have a brain mm -hmm. to be inside this and at the same time perceive this. Yeah. And this, for me, is an absolute miracle. And maybe one could say, this is what I, I don't know if believe, this is what I, amazes me. That's the right word. That's what amazes me. I find mm -hmm. it absolutely mindful that this is the way it is. Mm -hmm. And that we have this language and we come and talk to each other and you, you sit in Sri Lanka and I'm here. And this is mind blowing. <laughs> This is absolutely crazy. This is crazy, yes. This is crazy. So, <laughs> this is my final statement. Nice <laughs> Thank you, Gabriel. And uh, well, looking forward to whatever. Yes, absolutely. And I'm looking forward to like continuing this conversation with you. Um, and hopefully we, we will get this out, uh, get this episode uh, by next week. And then um, if people have questions, comments, I can possibly forward them to you and you'd be, I know that you'd be happy to respond. Uh, thank you so much, Gabriel, for joining with me. Uh, it's an absolute delight and pleasure to have you. An honor to have you because uh, it's the first time that we've been talking about such, an ex such a great project, prolific project. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye. Cheers. Cheers.